I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of St Vincent and the Grenadine, Grenadines to introduce an address by the Head of Government. Thank you, Madam President. I have the honour to introduce the pre-recorded statement of Dr. the Honourable Ralph E. Gonsalves, Prime Minister of St Vincent and the Grenadines. Prime Minister Gonsalves. Mr. President, Excellencies, distinguished delegates and friends. 75 years ago, our predecessors founded this noble institution as the primary international platform to promote dignity, security, and freedom for all. Crafted in the midst of seething political tensions and the immense human suffering wrought by preceding global wars, our United Nations has served humanity's most credible attempt at securing a peaceful and prosperous future for all nations and peoples. Yet, as we convene today against the backdrop of the COVID-19 pandemic, the likes of which we have not experienced in over a century, the future we want and we all rightfully deserve appears in grave jeopardy. Amidst the rising tides of climate change, the scourge of desertification and land degradation, including in the Sahel, the challenges to biodiversity, the social, political, and economic inequities of the global economy, and the unevenness and contradictions of a lopsided multilateral system in which the norms and rules are conveniently applied and upheld in favor of the powerful. Amidst all these things, the bellowing calls for global reform and a renewed multilateralism reverberate ever more loudly. We are indeed at an important crossroad. A well-functioning United Nations, fit for the purpose of safeguarding the bedrock principles of sovereignty, territorial integrity, and political independence of all states, while addressing the critical issues of our times is urgently needed. Mr. President, COVID-19 has laid bare the indisputable fact that coordinated multilateral action to achieve the sustainable development goals is the surest pathway to global peace and security. In our increasingly interconnected and hyper-globalized world, we protect ourselves when we safeguard our neighbors. Indeed, peace and security are the ideals of a collective identity molded through stable relationships. The urgent challenges of our times cannot be solved by building walls, nor can they be effectively addressed by retreating to a corner of nationalistic isolationism. We must build bridges. And we must stand shoulder to shoulder with our brothers and sisters throughout the world as we lift each other up from the feverish ashes of COVID-19. In this regard, St. Vincent and the Grenadines pays tribute to all frontline workers and first responders, our capeless heroes, whose selfless contributions and sacrifices have kept many of us safe throughout the pandemic. We also extend our sympathies to the many families who have endured suffering throughout this ordeal. We stand with you as you honor the memories of your loved ones. We must keep the faith and more. Mr. President, the simple truth is that the COVID-19 pandemic has brought about a profoundly altered condition of life, living, and production. None of the awesome challenges arising from this altered condition can be solved by incrementalism or minimalist pragmatism, which merely tinkers with the pre-existing global e economy. To be sure, human ingenuity and science will produce a vaccine within the next few months or a year, and the COVID rate of infection hospitalization and deaths will come down globally. But haunting questions remain. 
would the vaccine be available cheaply and universally to all peoples the world over? Or would its distribution be so skewed and across countries that there is likely to arise a deafening roar that only rich lives matter? The good intentions of our United Nations and its specialized agencies, such as the World Health Organization, may nibble away at the inequity of a skewed outcome, but their impacts are likely to be only marginal unless there is an enforceable international rules-based compact between all countries and major pharmaceutical companies to deliver universally and affordably the fruits of science and human ingenuity. It cannot be the usual result of corporate profits ahead of people's lives, livelihoods, social solidarity, and security. Even if in this instance of COVID-19, the international community rises to the challenge and confirms that faith and good intentions without practical works is an illusion, would this be only an episodic response which leaves the pre-existing global order in place until the next and inevitable pandemic arises. This irrational, dangerous cycle has to be reconfigured with a global consensus, not merely to build back better, but to build back optimally and enduringly for all humanity's sake. Fundamentally, Mr. President, the old order is passing away before our very eyes as a consequence of the pandemic. But a new one is yet to come into being. Indeed, there is not in place even a transition to a better, optimal, and enduring condition. We are still quarreling about inconsequential matters insisting on too many sideshows and casting our gaze askance from the main events, metaphorically. It is a truism repeatedly ignored by powerful nations globally and ruling classes in dominant countries that our central global challenges cannot be solved in isolation of each other or only on the terms of the powerful. Yet, the old reflexes kick in, harming inevitably the strong and the weak, though not in equal measure. So we end up, metaphorically, with a proud man who is ignorant of that which he is most assured. Right reason and mature reflection teach that over the past 50 years, of the dominant human civilization and its appending offshoots. There has been an explosion of individualism and freedom engendered by a huge enlargement of personal, financial, technological, and social spaces. Atomized individuals, and indeed atomized individualism, this has been elevated as the apotheosis of progress and social solidarity has become frayed, tattered, and diminished as a public good. So along comes a pandemic, and the atomized individual has to rely on the prudent and collective good, and the good behavior of his neighbors to stay healthy. This circle cannot be easily squared in an individualistic, dog-eat-dog -dog social order. And metaphorically, all hell has broken loose. Thus, internally in our societies, we ought in the current altered condition to build a social individual, not an atomized one. This social individual necessarily has to be grounded in the requisite of social solidarity. Across nations, too, we must initiate and build a fresh compact of enduring solidarity as we in our Caribbean community, CARICOM, 
have done with much success despite a limitation of resources. Our United Nations and its specialized agencies are the locales for the construction of an ambitious, renewed global compact, not of world government, but of a genuine community of nations through a bona fide multilateralism grounded in international law. This is not merely a technical exercise, but a profoundly political one of the first order, in which this revitalized compact is efficaciously fashioned on the fertilized soil of genuine commitment among all nations. Let us thus lift humanity higher. In this regard, powerful states must roll back their unilateralist, unwholesome, and prejudicial constraints on weaker nations. The list is long and includes unilateralist sanctions, weaponizing of the trade, banking, and financial systems, the misuse and abuse of so-called blacklists by developed countries against developing ones, the unilateralist termination of correspondent banking relations on purely spurious and hypocritical grounds, the breaking of international law willy-nilly to serve narrow national interests on this or that issue, including the existential matter of climate change and the relegation of small island developing states to the expendable margins of the global political economy. Mr. President, as a small island developing state, faced with an exceptional and unique admixture of existential circumstances, ranging from our inherent vulnerabilities as a small open economy with porous borders to the legacies of underdevelopment left in the wake of European settler colonialism, native genocide, the enslavement of Africans, and the indentureship of Madeirans and Indians. St. Vincent and the Grenadines has made tremendous strides to advance meaningfully a progressive and people-centered development agenda. Yet, despite our, our best efforts, the disastrous economic implications of a global COVID-19 recession threatens to stymie our advances. These detrimental impacts, already disproportionately felt across the global south, stem from sharp declines in remittances, significant disruptions of trade, travel, and other economic activity, and the negative effects on social welfare as limited resources are diverted to save lives. For small island developing states, without predictable and reliable financing through concessional loans, without scaled up development assistance and flexible and innovative forms of debt relief, we risk falling further behind, unable to safeguard our human development agenda or provide necessary social protection to many of our people. To avert these grim prospects, ambitious reform of the international financial architecture that takes into account our small islands exceptionalism is urgently required. Mr. President, the continued use of the illegal and inhuman economic embargo on the Republic of Cuba and the unilateral economic sanctions imposed for the purpose of stoking social unrest as a part of an externally driven regime change agenda in the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela are but two egregious examples of how the norms and principles of international law are desecrated for sake of power and self-interest. Despite their own serious challenges, the governments and peoples of Cuba and Venezuela continue to stand as models of camaraderie and solidarity dispatching medical brigades and essential supplies in response to COVID-19. Such is the absurd contradiction that those who employ the human rights mantra as a guise for unilateral action would willfully deprive millions of people 
living in countries near and far of their right to dignity and development by deploying the most debilitating foreign policy tools. The immense suffering of the people of Syria as a result of a conflict that they did not choose and geopolitical forces over which they exert no influence stands as a prime example of the paradox of humanitarian intervention. In similar fashion, the convergence of a parallelogram of forces, contradictory forces, in Yemen has precipitated a humanitarian crisis of monumental proportions. Syria and Yemen are arguably two of the biggest catastrophes in the world, which require constructive forms of multilateral engagement that yield people-centered solutions with full respect for international law. I feel sure that interested regional powers yearn for peace and stability in Yemen and Syria. Mr. President, St. Vincent and the Grenadines reaffirms its solidarity with the Palestinian people, whose daily existence remain marred by the persistent threat of illegal annexation. Honoring the Palestinian people's long-held quest for self-determination and statehood by revisiting the question of full membership of the United Nations is a matter that is long overdue and an essential component of lasting solution, a lasting two-state solution in the quest for a sustainable peace in the Middle East. Both Palestine and Israel must get together and sort this matter out. In a similar vein, the constructive and pragmatic intergovernmental engagement of Taiwan as a responsible advocate for sustainable development and an exemplar of the magnificent Chinese civilization validates the case for Taiwan's meaningful participation in the specialized agencies and bodies of the United Nations. Mr. President, the complex challenges of the 21st century will not be solved by military means or by a quest for hegemony. While those who sell weapons have been traditionally positioned to broker peace, we cannot expect to use outdated tools to address effectively contemporary exigencies. Accordingly, St. Vincent and the Grenadines reiterates the importance of addressing earnestly the question of Security Council reform by, among other things, expanding the permanent membership to include our brothers and sisters from the African continent, by incorporating the nuanced perspectives of small island states as a continuously rotating fixture, and by upgrading the working methods of this august but historically shackled body to reflect the realities of the modern world. The issue continues to occupy the attention of St. Vincent and the Grenadines at the Security Council, where my country has forged a strong partnership with the three non-permanent members from Africa in what has become known as the A3 plus one. Mr. President, amidst the thundering calls for racial and social justice globally, St. Vincent and the Grenadines affirms yet again that black lives matter. During this international decade for people of African descent, the case for reparatory justice remains unanswerably strong. The legacies of underdevelopment in our country arising from the genocide of our native Kalinago and Garifuna people and the enslavement of African bodies prompt our just and legitimate demand for appropriate recompense grounded in historical fact, contemporary reality, and international law. From European nations and their successor nation states in North America, the international campaign for reparatory justice, widely promoted by governments across the Caribbean community and by social activists 
within the industrialized countries must form part of any serious effort to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. Mr. President, as I conclude, I reiterate that the complex, consequential, and overlapping challenges facing our world today can only be resolved through inclusive, multilateral solutions and comprehensive development strategies. Admittedly, in any collective struggle for peace or prosperity, there are no easy victories. Yet, it is in our darkest moments, when these struggles seem insurmountable, that we must work together in unity and in solidarity, not in spite of, but precisely because our distinct perspectives and interests necess necessitate that we, the peoples, work together. As we embark on a new decade of our collective journey, let us craft a more just and equitable world in which all nations and peoples participate meaningfully in measured apportionment of burden and benefit. I thank you. Au nom de l'Assemblée... On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the Prime Minister, Minister for Finance, the Public Service, National Security, Legal Affairs and Grenadines Affairs of St. Vincent and the Grenadines for his statement.